Good morning, folks. Uh, today we're going to be doing communion together, um, and I've been wondering about how you're going to do it with your mask on. So we'll have to see how well you can pull it. No, we don't have to do that. Uh, Pastor JJ was actually at a uh, conference where, uh, uh, online conference seminar, where they explain different things in Pennsylvania. And you do not need to wear a mask if you're doing what I'm doing, speaking. If you're doing what they're doing, uh, leading worship. Or the third one was communion. And this came actually from a lawyer that was discussing the things that you need to do in Pennsylvania for church. So uh, we do ask you to wear the mask during the church service, but at least for communion, we can take it off. And there's there's two parts real quickly. I'll, I'll go over it um, right now. So. Uh, but there's the little plastic, and it's just a little piece of plastic. You pull that off for the wafer, and then the, the harder one is the, 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 for the juice. And so uh, we'll go over that a little bit later. I uh, want to bring a couple announcements to us, uh, oh, particularly for our online service. We want to uh, remind those who are online that we um, uh, will be continuing to do our Tuesday online. Um, uh, God is... Uh, the church is important. Why the church is important with Pastor JJ. Uh, so we encourage everyone to, to be watching that. Next week, uh, Pastor JJ, myself, and others were planned to be gone at a wedding. So uh, we have uh, our missionaries, uh, Steve and Ruthie. I was thinking they'd be here today, but uh, uh, Steve and Ruthie, hi, online. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, Steve will be preaching. Ruthie will be leading worship, but I will be here also. And so I will be doing a Facebook Live that evening, and then we'll have the service the following day on Monday. So that's a little bit of change, particularly for those of you who are watching online. I will be online, and I'll be going over my next series. So I finished up my last series last week. I'll be starting a new series in Matthew chapter 16. And we're looking at the text where, where Peter um, uh, professes Christ, uh, Jesus as the Christ. And then, uh, then Jesus talks about what the Christ will have to go through. And Peter says, may it not be. And Jesus says, get behind me. And then uh, Jesus then talks about what it means to follow him. And so we'll look at three aspects through this next series. And I'm going to overview that on the Facebook Live on next Sunday at 6.30. So even those of you who are not online, we welcome you to join us at 6.30. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, the whole idea of who, it, um, who Christ is. And then the second part, um, why Christ came. And then the third part, looking at following Christ, um, what uh, Christ expects or uh, what what Christ means to us. So, so uh, we'll be looking at those three aspects and I'll overview for probably about a half hour of that, that sermon series and talk about a few other things. Um, any other announcements, Pastor Jesus? Next week's service online okay. will be on Monday at 6.30. 6.30 Monday uh, again, and that will be with um, Ruthie and Steve. So uh, I also uh, want to, to mention our prayer needs today. Uh, we have uh, several prayer needs. Uh, Miguel is back in the hospital, so continue to pray for him. Um, he has multiple things going on, including now problems with his pacemaker. I talked with him uh, last night. It's very hard for him to be back um, in the hospital, so be in prayer for him. Uh, the scab that's developed, internal scab, that keeps opening, keeps bleeding, um, that seems to be a problem. He has kidney stones. Um, he also needs the surgery for his hernia, so he's just got four things going on, um, so keep him in prayer. Um, also, uh, pray for Julie's, her continued healing of her foot and hip um, after surgery. And then uh, we also want to pray for um, Ron Vermeerbeek, Joan's husband. He's going to be having uh, spine surgery on Tuesday. Um, and then finally, Kathy, uh, we found out on Tuesday that she's going to need two more surgeries. So that was a little bit discouraging. Um, and uh, we, on Thursday, we were on the way to the hospital. Uh, she's not doing well. It's been really tough. Um, so, and, and again, she still has severe colitis. Uh, the, they were hoping that the, the diverted uh, colostomy would, would uh, help to, uh, you know, relieve some of that. Uh, but she's still in a lot of pain. Um, showered today, even to come to church, but just couldn't. She was just really, really sick today. So continue to pray for her. Pastor JJ, lead us in worship. <laughs>
want to remind you there is a basket in the, uh, for the offering in the back. Again, we're trying to social distance, so we put, put that in the back if you'd like to give. And for those of you online, uh, we again, if, if you would like to give to the Lord in that way, please send it to the church. Uh, that's how we're receiving uh, those gifts and offerings. Let's pray and thank the Lord for the opportunity to give back and honor Him in that way. And let's also bring the prayer requests that we have before us. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you together. And thank you for the opportunity to worship in our tithes and our giving. And we pray that uh, you would honor that and that you would help us all to be good stewards for your glory and honor. And we, we thank you that all we have is yours. And we just uh, praise you that, uh, that uh, Christ gave his life. We pray that our lives would be fully committed and de uh, dedicated to you. Uh, Lord, we also want to pray for the needs in the church. I pray for my wife, Kathy, and just pray that you would just grant her extra grace during this time where she's in a lot of pain, uh, for the two surgeries to come, and, and the perspectives that, that, uh, of that. We just really commit her to you. Uh, we, we pray for your grace in both of our lives as uh, it takes an emotional toll also. Mm -hmm. Uh, Father, we also uh, lift up Miguel, who's been back and forth in the hospital so many times. Uh, Lord, five or six times now, it seems like, and we just really commit uh, these multitude of problems that he has that keep sending him back, and we, we pray for, particularly for that scab uh, in his uh, esophagus, that that would heal and, and, and that uh, it wouldn't keep uh, uh, causing the, the, the internal bleeding, and uh, we commit the other things to you, too, from, from his um, uh, pacemaker to the kidney stones. Uh, to even his hernia. We commit these things to you. Uh, we pray continually for Julie that her foot and hip might continue to heal. And uh, we finally lift up uh, Ron and Mirbrick uh, this week. We just pray as he has surgery that you would protect him. Uh, we pray for uh, the complications of the spine, Lord, and just uh, know that, that that's something that, that we just lift up and pray that the surgeons would have the skill um, and that uh, he would heal quickly. Be with Joan, Lord, as she, um, as she, she waits, and uh, it's very difficult. I know, having been in that position myself recently through surgery, having to wait while your spouse is in surgery, just commit her to you. And thank you in Christ's name. Oh uh -huh. 
to communion, I want to bring to us uh, three words, three words that come from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and the first word, it's actually not the first in order, but the first word we want to look at is the word to examine. Uh, God wants us to examine ourselves as we come uh, and partake of communion. We should actually even be doing that before we partake of communion. Uh, secondly, uh, the whole idea of remembering the remembrance of Christ, what it means to remember Him. And then thirdly, the word proclaim. We find these three words in the text from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So let me read for us uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The morning service I had in my paper right there. Um, for I received from the Lord, starting with verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus... On the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But, or therefore, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. As we consider the importance today of, of coming together in communion, I, again, I want us to start with that last word, to examine. It means to test. It means to, as word study uh, puts it, to kind of uh, test and examine to the point that you know it's genuine. And then, you know, you, you ask the question, you know, what does God want genuinely from me today? And, and again, I encourage us before we come to communion, it's been since... Uh, February when we had our last communion together in this way uh, but but when, when we come to communion we ask the question is my walk with Jesus great today is my walk with Jesus great not just good because if, if it's not great then then we need to examine in fact, in 2 Corinthians, the same word is used of examination. The same word is used in, in chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians where it says, examine to see if you are of the faith. And so it's vitally important for us to be doing this work as we come. So that when we do come and when we do partake together, we're doing something specific. The act of worship is in remembrance. And if you notice, that word remembrance is important because it's used twice. Both of the body and the bread and then the cup and the blood. And the word literally means, the word remembrance means to bring to your mind. Now I want to read for you what, what Vine's Expository Dictionary says about this specific word and this idea of bringing to mind or recollection. Vine says, it's not in memory of... In other words, we're not having a memorial service. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. He's at the right hand of God. And because He's omnipresent God, He's with us here literally today also. So this isn't a memorial. This is an in memory of. But He goes on to say, but an affectionate calling 
of the person of himself to mine. So really what we do is when we partake of the wafer, and yes, today it's going to be a wafer, it's not one of the crackers, the matzo crackers we use. But as, as we partake of that wafer, as we drink of the cup, we are bringing to mind the special reality of the gospel that Jesus was a sacrificial lamb and he sacrificed his body for you and me and that his body was raised from the dead and taken up and is now at the right hand of God the Father. And then when we partake of the cup and we drink the juice, we remember, we call to mind, we bring to mind the fact that his blood was the remission the cost, the redemption from our sin was paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're doing when we partake of communion. But there's a third word. So we examine, right? And, and we remember, but we, by doing so, we proclaim. This word used 17 times in the New Testament, it's usually translated, of the 17 times, it's primarily used in the book of Acts. Uh, 10 times in the book of Acts. And, and this word primarily is translated preach <laughs> or preaching. That's the idea of proclaiming. But when it's a verb, and Bine also points this out and others do too, but when it's a verb, it means to show. Or, as Vine puts it specifically, to set forth. So, what we do when we partake of communion, we set forth Christ, we show Christ, we proclaim Him in partaking of communion together. What a beautiful picture. Uh, that word is used uh, only four times. Or, I'm sorry, ten times I said but that word of the ten of, of the seventeen times it's used, I have to backtrack of remembrance, it's only used four times. But that word that's used to preach, to proclaim, or to show forth Christ is also used in Acts 26. Let's, let me read that to you. That Christ would suffer. We looked at last week at suffering, didn't we? The suffering of Christ. That he would be the first to rise from the dead. By the way, others were risen from the dead, but they weren't risen with new eternal bodies. Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead. And would proclaim light. Isn't that amazing? What do we proclaim when we partake of communion? We proclaim that Jesus is the light of the world. And that his gift to us of salvation is real. And so, let's partake together today. Uh, first of all, and if you're at home and you're in the uh, video uh, worship time, uh, we encourage you to have some juice and some bread also. Uh, Sandra's right in the back there, yeah, they're, they're right there. But don't peel off the whole thing. Just a little plastic, yeah, see that plastic? You peel that off, all right? And yes, you can take off your mask. It's actually legal. <laughs> Just for communion. <laughs> Christ in the night in which he was betrayed took bread and broke it and said this is my body which is given for you and then in another text it says he says take eat Pastor JJ would you give thanks for the body that was given for us Father, we want to thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for sending your son to, to come to this earth and, and live a life and to ultimately be, uh, to, to go to the cross for us, Lord. We thank you for the body that was broken for us. And we thank you for the salvation that we can have in Jesus Christ because of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now you can take the second part off. It's a little harder. Don't spill it. It's easy to spill. Uh, likewise, after supper, Christ also took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then in that other text, he says, Take, drink.
Thank you, oh God, for the beauty of this service that we bring to mind the greatness of the work of Jesus Christ. His body, the sacrificial lamb, freely given for us, his blood shed for us, that we might have remission, removal of sin. Father, we are so grateful for our Savior and our redemption that the price was paid. And we give thanks in his name. Amen. There are garbage cans all around so we can social distance. Again, we're looking at uh, Psalm 46, and today we're specifically going to be looking at verse 10. And verse 10 says this, it says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we recognize the importance for us to cease striving and to know that you are indeed God. And Father, as we look at this text, as we consider your word, may our hearts be deeply impacted by who you are. May we truly know that you are God. 
For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is a common verse right here that we're looking at. Uh, in fact, this is the kind of verse that maybe uh, someone would go out and buy a banner and put the banner maybe in your home or something. Kind of like that banner right over there, right? Uh, we have it in our very own church. Be still and know that I am God. It's a very powerful scripture. But I wanted to make one note as we look uh, at our text. If you notice in the previous verses, when we talk about God, it's always in this he form. Uh, God is our refuge, right? Uh, when it talks about, come behold the works of the Lord. Who has done this? Who has done this? And all of a sudden, verse 10, you see a switch. It says, see striving and know that I, right? So it's no longer who God is. This is who God is, knows his works, knows who he is. He's a great God. It's now I. God is speaking in the first person right here. Cease striving and know that I am God. This idea of to cease striving is not a very easy word to translate. In fact, I was very surprised as I studied it. Uh, in the 46 times that it's used in the Old Testament, uh, only, uh, only one, word, one time is it translated consistently, and that's only five times of the 46 all kinds of different translations and ideas of this word. And I just want to give you a, a little idea of how complex the uh, definition of this word is, okay? Uh, so Strong says this, it could mean to sink, relax, sink down, let drop, abate, cease, consume, draw toward evening, fail, be faint, be wax, feeble, or forsake. Those are the different t things that they could mean according to Strong's. And, and, and many different uh, times, especially in, in the scripture, we see it used in different ways. Sometimes in a very positive way, sometimes in very negative ways. Uh, Strong says this, he says, Be still means properly to cast down, to let fall, to let hang down, then to be relaxed, slackened, especially the hands. It is also employed in the sense of not making an effort or putting forth exer exertion and then would express the idea of leaving matters with God or being without uh, anxiety about an issue. And by the way, this doesn't even cover uh, some of the other words that I saw used, such as lazy and, and other things like that. So there's all kinds of definitions for this specific word. I think the main idea that you have in regards to this cease striving is this, that we rest, we surrender, and we're letting go. And, and this is a struggle for, for many people. Many of, of the uh, commentators talk to us specifically about this verse in regards to the issue of opposition, opposition uh, in regards to God. Boyce says this, uh, he says, lay down your arms, surrender, and acknowledge that I am the one, the only victorious God. You see, there is only one God, and he indeed is a very powerful and great God. He is good. He is perfect. He is love. And we must take care to surrender to him and to stop striving against him. Now, you might think real quickly that this is in regards to the unbeliever. But I would propose to us that I think even in the life of the believer, we can sometimes be in opposition to God. When God wants you to rest or to take a moment, sometimes we don't do that. I've got to be honest. When I was wrestling with this passage, I forgot my story at the, end, at the beginning. I usually have to start off with a story, right? Uh, the story I was going to share with you is just this, that, man, I struggled with this passage today. I've struggled with this because I find myself constantly on the go, constantly on the move, it's doing something, whether it's for my job or whether, whether it, it's counseling or church work or, or whether it's dealing with my kids or caring for my wife or whether it's being entertained and watching TV or video game or whatever. I'm always doing something. And it was just a challenge to sit and think, just cease, Jay. Rest. Let down your arms in a sense, right? Surrender to God. And man, I've just got to be honest. I think this is something that we really, in our culture today, struggle with. To just be still or to cease striving and to just be still. Don't stop surrendering to Him. We need to cease trying to do things our own way. We look to His way, not our way. His way is higher, not ours. He is above us. He is greater than us. He is, he, he loves better. He is the only one, the only God, 
the Holy One. And when we consider those things, those are things that should cause us to stop and just jaw dropped, right? Wow. Look at who God is. Like I said, almost all the commentators associate the idea of ceasing from opposition, laying down your arms and acknowledging uh, who God is, that God is God. Clark says this, he says, that ye may deeply reflect on the severity and goodness of God, severity to those who are brought down and destroyed, goodness to those who are raised up and exalted. Cease from sin and rebellion against your God. So you have this idea of the opposition, right? And I think it's also very important in regards to this to remember our context. Remember that we looked at the works of God and we saw it in regards to desolations, but also bringing peace. You see uh, uh, an aspect where, where God uh, is very severe, but you also see a situation where God is very good. And so I think that's what Clark is drawing on. And in this text, we see that God is our refuge. He is our help. And we have also seen how God is the one who brings desolations to make war cease. The severity and the goodness of God. The call is ultimately for us to stop rebelling, to stop sinning, and not be in opposition to God. I want to look at a scripture today, Deuteronomy. Uh, and, and as you turn there, I'd love for you to stick your finger in Deuteronomy as well, because we're going to come back to it when we look at the second point. In this uh, chapter of Deuteronomy, we actually have both of our words to cease striving, but we also have the same word to know. Uh, so uh, be still and know that I am God. So in this passage, we actually have both words used. And uh, for time's sake, I'm, uh, I was going to read a little bit more just to give some context uh, for it, But I think the important part is to, to just recognize that Moses is talking to the people, and this is right before they're about to, to, uh, to enter the land, and Moses knows he's not going to go with them. And, and so he's, he's telling them, listen, there's going to be a time when you turn away from God, and there's going to be all kinds of things that, 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 that causes you to, to serve other gods and, and, to, and to, uh, 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 to, to serve gods made of, of man's hands and wood and stone and all these different things. But then it says in verse 29, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. Man, do you hear the, the power just in that statement that, that when you search for him with all your heart and soul, you need to seek God with all our heart and soul. Verse 30, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you, in later days you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. Now, verse 31, which is where we have our word. For the Lord your God is, com is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers, which he has sworn to them. I don't know if you caught where our word was. Again, like I said, it's translated many different ways. Cease striving. Do you see cease striving in there? It's, it's, it's not very easy to find, but it actually it's the same word as not fail. He will not fail you. So when we look at this concept of this word, you could look at God will not cease striving for you. You could look at that in our text. Or in our text, you could even look at it from the perspective of, of uh, uh, stop failing God. Right? So you could kind of look at both of them there. And I think the important thing that we understand is Moses is urging his people to obey God's law, to recognize who he is. And the issue of sin is such a, a big issue. And the call in verse 29 is to seek after God. The call is to seek with God with all your heart, with all your soul. And God's compassion and promise will not fail. He will not cease striving for you. It will not, or, 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 or we will, um, or he will not stop striving for you. So it, with that in mind, uh, so I have some questions to go through in regards to application of cease striving. The first is this, how might I be opposed to God? I think it's an important question for us to ask. And I got to be honest, as I was telling you about the conviction in my own personal life this week, as I wrestled with this, there's a lot of ways that I could see, man, I, I, I'm not stopping. I, I'm, I'm resisting. I'm doing this. And I had to really wrestle with that this week. But I, I would propose to us that there's many different ways that we are in opposition to God. Every time we sin, we're in opposition to God, are we not? 
There's lots of different ways that we can be in opposition. I think we need to take some time to reflect and to think upon what are those ways that I may be in opposition to God. Secondly, what does it mean for me to cease striving today? What does it mean for me to cease striving today? Maybe that means letting your arms down, being quiet. Maybe it, maybe it means being still. Maybe it means uh, that you are in direct opposition. You need to stop sitting. I don't know what it would be for you, but what would it be right now for you to cease striving the way our text is encouraging us to do? I think it's a question we need to ask of ourselves. And thirdly, am I seeking God with all my heart and soul? Am I seeking God with all my heart? all my soul. I think that in my life I've experienced a lot of times where I was seeking God and I was very focused on that and then as time went on I maybe was forgetful or I got focused on something else and I wasn't seeking God with all my heart and soul but man how desperately I want to be a man who seeks God with all my heart with all my soul and I hope that's your heart as well to want and desire to seek God with all your heart and with all your soul second point I want to look at is knowing that knowing that this word according to Strong's uh, has the idea to acknowledge or, or acquainted with advise answer a point assuredly be aware that's what this idea of to know means so not only are we called to not uh, to, to cease striving but we're also called to know God wants us to know that he is God it's not just enough to say man I really feel God right now right I feel God's presence in my life. That's a great thing, by the way. If you feel God's presence in your life today, praise the Lord for that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock that. But I also want to say, it's not just enough to just feel. Because guess what? Feelings go in and out, don't they? Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're frustrated, right? We go through roller coasters with feelings. Sometimes I'm not feeling certain things. And I may not always feel God right now in this moment. I may not always experience that feeling, but to know that God is with me, to know who God is, is so important. I believe, truly, you can know God in the midst of hurt, in the midst of depression, in the midst of anxieties. I believe that you can know God in the midst of incredible amounts of hurt. And that may not mean that you feel God's presence in that moment, but it can be that you know that he's there and that he loves you and he is good. Sometimes knowing is an important aspect to the people, the kind of people that we need to be. It's not just a guess or a good idea. It's to truly understand and know. Barnes says this, there was to be a calm, confident trustful state of mind in view of the displays of the divine presence and power the mind was to be calm in view of the fact that god had interposed and had shown that he was able to defend his people when surrounded by dangers how important it is for us to know to stop and to know that god is god when things feel overwhelming and I feel lost and I don't know what to do, to stop and to know God is still God. What an important thing for us to be able to remember. There was a commentator, I couldn't remember what, I, I didn't write it down unfortunately. I, I, usually I write down any quotes I, I ever get, but for whatever reason I forgot this. But one of the commentators said this, he said, our submission is to be such as becomes rational creatures. God does not require us to submit contrary to reason, but to submit as seeing the reason and ground of submission. God is not a God who is just completely uh, not reasonable at all. The grounds for our submission actually does involve our minds. Our minds are to be engaged with who God is. And when you study the word of God and begin to understand who God is, you see that he makes sense. He makes more sense than anything this world has to offer. The concept of God is not irrational as many people in our world would want us to think. He is indeed rational. 
And when we understand who God is, we can know him too. I was talking to a friend this week. Really impacted me. Um, a friend that I had uh, been in ministry with at one point in time. Uh, and uh, really uh, a good friend of mine, someone that meant a lot to me. I hadn't talked to her for quite a while and uh, randomly started talking on Facebook. And uh, I, I uh, found out that uh, she is, she's no longer a Christian. She's, she's left the faith. And I, I'll be honest, my heart was, was very broken over that in, in many ways. And we had a, a good conversation. It, it wasn't a bad conversation. But it just got me thinking a lot about the struggle that I have seen in so many people to really know that God is God. In some ways, we, there's so many people that put on a show to, to try to act like they, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in God. But do they truly know within their, within their heart, within their mind, that God indeed is God? And I believe it's such an important thing. We need to know that He is God. Have you ever heard of the statement, there are no absolutes? If you live in the secular world, I'm sure you've heard something like that. Obviously, if you think about that rationally, does that even make sense? There are no absolutes. If, in order for that to be true, then there, that would have to be an absolute, right? So that statement is actually uh, an absolute. So it makes no sense at all, even in the context of, of that statement. But the, our world would love to say that truth is relative. Truth is something that you can know in your experience or in your person or, or something along those lines. And I gotta say that that is not rational, is it? Rational says there is truth and that truth comes from somewhere and we know where that truth is. It's in the word of God and it's in who God is. No, God. There are not many ways. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There aren't many ways. There's one way. You can't make God into who, whomever you want him to be. And we cannot make anything else be God, but God. He is our absolute. So I want to encourage us today to take time to cease striving and to know with all your mind and your heart that he is God. I want you to turn once more to me, with me to Deuteronomy. Deut Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 32. Picking off where we left off. The word know that's in our text in Psalms is used twice in this section that we're going to be looking at. And I'll point it out as we go. Verse 32 it says, Indeed, ask now concerning... The former days, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and inquired from, e from one end of the heavens to the other. Has anything been done like this great thing? Or has anything been heard like it? Has any people heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire, as you have heard it and survived? Or has a God tried to go to take for himself a nation within another nation by trials or signs and wonders, by war and by might, by, by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm and by ter great terrors as the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Remember, they would have experienced that firsthand. The plagues of Egypt, remember, they experienced that. They saw what God did. They saw what God did to part the Red Sea and to walk across. They saw again and again how God provided for them through providing water from a rock, by providing manna on the ground for them to eat every day. They saw works of God on a consistent basis. Verse 35, to you it was shown that you might know the Lord, he is God, and there is no other beside him. Out of the heavens, he let you hear his voice to discipline you. And on the earth, you, uh, he let you see his great fire, and you heard his words from the midst of the fire, because he loved your fathers. Therefore, he chose their descendants after them, and he personally brought you from Egypt by his great power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in and to give you their land for inheritance as it is today. 
Verse 39, know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. And I wanted to look at this passage because obviously you see both of our words are used in this context. But if you look back at what God had done through, through Moses and, and, and in the midst of the Israelites, they saw wonders and signs from God. They, they followed God in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night, right? They saw the wonders of God and it was there for them to know. To know that God is God. And folks, I want to encourage us, just as it was true for the Israelites back then, it was important for them to know that God was God. And by the way, I think that helped them very much as they go into the land and the story of, of Joshua, right? They knew that God was with them uh, and they had a lot of victory in the book of Joshua. But I want to also make note that it's important for us to know too. We may not see a pillar of fire, but God wants you to know, to know that he is God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, To grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are called to grow in our knowledge. If you've been a believer for, for 40 years, 50 years, however long, that's great. But let me tell you, we still need to grow. We still need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me finally in closing to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. There are, I don't know that if, if they still did this in the, in the counseling program, but there, there are, we call it the, the four circles. Did you ever do the four circles, right? So and the four circles are, you know, uh, that we are uh, behavior, what we do, uh, our emotions, what we feel, uh, our mind and what we think, cognitive, and then there's also uh, our motives and why we do what we do. But you remember that, yeah? Uh, I learned that back, back in the day when I was at Karen. And, and, and one of the things that I think is really important for us is to be, th right now, for us to think about the context of what we know. Our minds, our cognitive aspect. We are called to have our minds set on Jesus. Now, that can be true in regards to our emotions, our affections. That's true. But in our context, we're looking specifically at our minds. And in Colossians chapter 3, it says this. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So that's where we're at right now, by the way, right? Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And it's, it's encouraging us to seek things that are above. Verse 2. Set your mind on the things above not on the things that are on the earth. I just got to be honest. I think our minds are sometimes very consumed with what's happening in my life right now. Our minds ought to be consumed with what is above. In verse 3, you have died for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your, our life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. That speaks to the future, right? But Christ, who is your life. So when we get focused on our life down here on earth, that's not where our life is. Our life is hidden with Christ and God. And when he is revealed, we are going to have life. That is something to look forward to. And the call for us is to set our minds on that. To have a, an eternal mindset. That's what God wants for you and I today. To have our minds full fixed on him. And who he is. Be still. Cease striving. And know. Know. Know today that 
God is God. So in closing, I have four points in application. The first one is this. Take time today, this week. Take time. Just know that he is God. Know it. If you have doubts, if you have struggles, if you have things that are, are, are keeping you from truly knowing, then wrestle them out because God wants you to know that he is your God. He is God. Take time today and know it. Not just say it, not just casually bring it up, but really set your mind and know today that he is God. Secondly, take time and know what God has done for you. It's the example that we see both in our text as well as in the text in Deuteronomy. Right before it says, cease striving and know, it says, come behold the works of the Lord, right? Pay attention to what he has done. And in Deuteronomy, is that not what Moses is telling the people? You saw God in miraculous ways. They were for you to be able to know that he is God. So take time and know what God has done for you. Take time and know what God has done for you. Listen, all we have to do is just start at thinking about that, 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 that salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And shouldn't that be enough for what God has done for us by sending his son to die on the cross for our sins? That should be enough in and of itself. But he has done even more for you and I. Let's take time to know what he has done for us. Thirdly, take time and know he is your life. Take time and know he's your life. Just as we looked at Colossians and talked about how Christ is our life and our life is hidden in Christ. Our, 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 our future is with Christ, with God. So let's take time to know what our life is really about. Have you ever heard the question, what is life really all about, right? What's the meaning of life? As believers, we know the meaning of life. It's to serve our holy, great God. So know what your life is about. It is about Him. And thirdly, and finally, take time and know Him. And when I say that, I mean seek Him. I mean walk with Him. That we were just, you just talk about in, our, in, in communion. About the importance of walking with God. May we take time and know Him by walking with Him. By studying His Word and growing. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the truth that we see in the scripture to cease striving and to know that you are God. Lord, help us to do that today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Great week, and we'll see you next week, Lord willing. Have a good day. Bye.